All right, this is uh, Grace in the Book of Romans. That's the name of the series. This is lesson number six in that series. The title of this particular lesson, The Response of Grace. This is the third part in this subject matter that we're covering. And uh, if you're following along in your Bibles, we will be at uh, Romans chapter four. Romans chapter four. So let's review what Paul describes as God's response of grace and that God's response of grace, Paul talks about that starting in Romans chapter three, verse 21, and he goes all the way to chapter six, verse 23, discussing that. So we begin by saying that God's initial expression of grace is the creation itself and putting man at the head of that creation. Uh, we've uh, followed along this pathway and learned that uh, man then rejected God's grace through disobedience which sends him into a headlong fall from grace into a cycle of spiritual and moral degeneration. Then Paul explains in Romans that God responds to this rejection of grace by a man with a, um, a second offer of grace which he outlines in Romans 3.21 all the way to 6.23. So basically Paul has taught so far that one, God pays man's moral debt of sin through the death of Jesus on the cross, Romans 3, 21 to 25. Secondly, God pronounces guilty man innocent based on his faith in Jesus Christ. Talks about that in Romans 3, 25 and 26. And then thirdly, God proclaims that salvation is accomplished by a system based on faith in an individual and not compliance to a standard. Very important, Romans 3, 21 to 26. So once Paul explains how and why God saves man, he then answers potential questions he thinks might come up as a result of this teaching. So the first question that may come up is, what about the law? If we are saved on the basis of faith in an individual and not compliance to rules, then what about the law? Do we discard it? Do we need it? Does it no longer have a purpose? That would be a kind of a natural question that would come you know, based on the teaching he's given them. So the answer that Paul gives is that the law's role is to reveal sin. That's the role of the law to reveal the sin in an individual. He writes, uh, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And as such, um, the law will always be necessary in the service to the gospel. You've got to know that you're a sinner before you, you, know, you desire to be saved. So the, the law, Paul says, always has its place, its proper place. So the gospel doesn't remove the law, it actually reveals its proper purpose and legitimacy. So we would read in chapter three, jumping ahead to 31, where he says, do we then nullify the law through faith? You know, this system of faith, does it eliminate the law? No, he says, may it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. When he says we establish the law, what he's saying is we establish the rightful purpose for the law within God's system of salvation. So the next question would naturally uh, come from the Jews. They would ask, well, what about Abraham? Didn't his compliance to God's will establish his righteousness? And isn't this state of salvation reserved only for the Jews anyways? So let's read uh, verses uh, one to three in chapter four as Paul is going to answer this. Question, he says, what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So Abraham's righteousness, when we use the word righteousness, we mean Abraham's innocence. Abraham's acceptability before God, Paul says this acceptability or righteousness was based on his faith. This is what Abraham learned through his experience with God. 
Now remember the definition of faith that we're working with. The definition of faith we're working with is believing as true what God has said despite the evidence to the contrary and acting upon that belief. That's, that's the definition of faith. All right? So let's keep going, verses four to eight. He says, now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. So here he makes his argument. He says, for the one who earns his righteousness by compliance to rules, his innocence is not bestowed as a gift, but rather it's his wage, it's what he's owed based on his success at compliance. Now he doesn't say this is possible. He's just saying, hypothetically, if someone could you know, uh, perform perfect compliance to the law, then God owes him innocence, God owes him righteousness because he's earned it. So Paul is not saying that it's possible to actually do this, only that it was, if it were possible, God would owe it to that person to judge him innocent. It's, this is only fair. However, for the person who is declared innocent because he believes God's promise, this is a favor from God and not a wage or not a salary a favor given because of faith. So he quotes David as David echoes the words of the grateful heart of a man forgiven on account of faith. And if there's anybody, <laughs> if there's anybody who knows something about being forgiven, it's David, right? We know the story, I, I, we don't have to go back and read it, his sin with Bathsheba. You know, what, what were the sins that he committed? Well, he committed adultery, first of all. He seduced another man's wife, committed adultery, and then premeditated murder. He had his, her husband killed to cover his adultery. And, and then an attempt at a cover-up before the nation. Now, according to the law, David should have been executed. I mean, for just one of those sins. But for adultery, murder, and lying to the nation, I mean, he was dead. He should have been executed and, of course, lost the throne. However, Nathan the prophet said to him, you are forgiven. I mean, you know, once David acknowledged his sins and asked for forgiveness, you know, David says, you're forgiven, or Nathan says, you're forgiven. And David believed him, and he carried on with his life, righteous before God. Such is the power of God's forgiveness. Verse nine, keep going in the idea. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Now Paul deals with the question, well, to whom was this blessing meant for? To Abraham and his descendants only or to all men? Are all men made righteous by believing or only the Jews? You know, the Jews read the word and thought that it was only for Abraham's descendants. You know, in other words, you know, if somebody is starting to come around to the idea we're not justified because of compliance to rules, but actually justified because we believe, okay, I'm coming around to that idea, that's not a bad idea. You know? And then the next question, yeah, but this good thing, that's just for us, right? <laughs> Surely that's not all for all the Gentiles, not the unwashed masses. Surely this wonderful gift's not for them, just for us. So Paul's going to answer this question. The answer, of course, is, uh, the, the answer to this question, of course, lies again in Abraham. Well, when was Abraham circumcised? Paul asks the rhetorical question. The sign, you know, circumcision, that bound all Jews together was given after God declared that Abraham was righteous because of his faith. In other words, God declared Abraham righteous because of his faith, and then later on down the road, Abraham was circumcised. So the unmistakable conclusion from a Jewish perspective was that righteousness by faith was originally offered 
to a Gentile, to a Gentile. No such thing as a Jew at the time of Abraham. The Jewish nation was formed out of his descendants, so the Jews did not exist. Abraham was the first one. So in verse 11 and 12, Paul is going to give a reason for this, verse uh, 10 and 11 actually. He says, how then was it credited, while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to him. So he was declared righteous while uncircumcised so that all Gentiles might identify with him as uncircumcised and respond with faith as Abraham did in order to become righteous. He becomes a symbol of those uh, and a pattern of those who are made righteous through a system of faith for the Gentiles. Now for those who are circumcised, he provides the example of faith so that his descendants can emulate his faith and thus be counted as true descendants. So those who are related to him not only culturally through circumcision, but spiritually as well because of their own righteousness based on faith like he was. So Abraham becomes the father of everyone. Why? Because of the way that he was made righteous. Both Jews and Gentiles become righteous in exactly the same way. So verse 13 to 17, he keeps on going. He says, or 12 rather, he says, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. For the promise to Abraham, or to his descendants, that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is no violation. For this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you, in the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. So a long passage here going back and forth, but try to stay in the idea that he's only talking about you know, how both Jews and Gentiles are made righteous through faith. Okay? So Paul reiterates that salvation is obtained for everyone through a system of faith and all who try to secure it by compliance to rules will fail. Whether they're Jews or Gentiles, it doesn't matter. That system does not accomplish righteousness before God. So Paul says salvation is a promise made to those who believe and to try to earn it through compliance changes it from a promise to a salary. You know where he says, where there is no law, there is no violation? This means that when one is obtaining salvation without reference to the law, as one does when obtaining it through faith, that person doesn't violate the law by doing so. There's nothing in the law, in other words, there's nothing in the law that prohibits you from searching for uh, salvation through faith. The law does not prohibit a person obtaining faith in that way. In other words, the Gentiles who believe do not desecrate the law by doing so, and this system of salvation by faith makes it fair for everybody, Jew and Gentile. Again, long passage, same point, making the same point. All right, verses 18 to 22. He says, in hope against hope, he's talking about Abraham now, and he's going to discuss Abraham's faith. He says, in hope against hope, he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations according to that which has been spoken. So shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in his faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in the faith 
giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. So Paul reviews the history and the context of Abraham's faith. Remember, remember our definition. Faith is believing God's word or God's promises as true, despite the evidence to the contrary and acting upon it. So God never gave Abraham a law. You ever notice that? You read the life of Abraham. Do you see anywhere where God is telling Abraham, do this, don't do that. You, you must observe this, you must observe that. Don't eat that food, don't drink wine. You know, do you see anywhere where God is giving Abraham any set of rules? No. He never gave him a law, no rituals, no specific rules of conduct, no moral code is you know, developed there. God made him a promise that he would be blessed with a son and many descendants and eventually they would be a nation and they would have their own land. God asked Abraham to believe that he would do this for him. Paul says here that Abraham despite the evidence to the contrary. Well, what evidence to the contrary? Well, number one, if he was going to get all this land, how was he going to get all this land? He was a nomad. He didn't live in a city, he lived in a tent, he wandered. He grew old without a natural born son. He was supposed to have descendants like the stars in the sky. He's 100 years old, doesn't have a son, not a natural one. He owned no property. His wife was barren and now too old to conceive at 90. But Paul says Abraham continued to believe that God would accomplish these things for him and because he continued to believe despite the evidence to the contrary, God declared him to be innocent and righteous despite many failures. Because we do read about his failures, don't we? He lies, he, he connives, he and his wife, you know. 23 to 25. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So what is it that we have to believe, Paul is saying? We don't have, we don't have a promise of a land or we're going to have descendants. You know, we don't get that promise. What's our promise? Well, the promise made to us is that we're going to resurrect from the dead. We're going to live eternally with God. That's the promise made to us. So he says here, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who was delivered over because of our transgression and was raised because of our uh, justification. So we have a different thing to believe. All right. Paul brings the matter into the present tense. Abraham is a model for faith, believing God on his promise and the reward that the blessings would come. Today, Paul says, the substance of what we are to believe is different. The promise today is not of children or land or descendants. God's promise is of forgiveness of our sins. Believe it or not, one of the biggest problems that people have, Christians have, they have trouble believing that their sins are forgiven. That's a big problem. A lot of the quote spiritual based counseling based on the difficulty that people have of believing that God has forgiven them because they can't forgive themselves. You know? Well, one of our sins, one of the sins that we suffer from Unforgiveness, right? We hold grudges, we have a hard time forgiving other people, we're critical, you know, that's a human nature, sinful human nature. So if you're having trouble forgiving somebody else, you can't forgive yourself. So you know, Paul is saying one of the promises is that he's actually forgiven you for all your dumb stuff. And also that the body will be resurrected. In other words, a conscious resurrection from the dead and eternal life. That's what we're asked to believe. Despite the evidence to the contrary. Well, what's the evidence to the contrary? That we'll live eternally? Well, everybody around us is dying. And as far as we know, they're still in the ground.
or that we'll be resurrected you know, perfect because we sure are not perfect now. As a matter of fact, the harder I try somehow, <laughs> the worse I get. So the nature of our response to God's promise is the same as it was for Abraham. It was just as fantastic for him to believe that God would give him all the land and descendants and so on and so forth. You know, it wasn't any harder for him to believe that than it is for us to believe that we'll be resurrected. Because we have one advantage, one great advantage, right? And what's that? Well, we're witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's been done. It's been done. So we're called upon to believe that His death does pay for all of our sins, all of them. We're called on to believe His resurrection. We're called on to believe that God forgives us, declares us innocent, and will resurrect us from the dead when Jesus returns. Believing this is what makes us righteous before God. All right. I'm going to take a little pause here from the passage itself and I want to do a little quiz with you. You can do it mentally in your mind. You don't have to do the pencil. It's on your, uh, use a pencil. It's on your sheet there. I want to do a faith check. I want to do a faith check. Okay? Um, and, and I'm not going to ask for people to say, well, what did you do? I'm not asking for you to share. As a matter of fact, even if you're sitting next to your spouse or whatever, you, know, you don't even have to share with them. This is just a private thing. So you can even do it in your head if you want. Okay? So here's the faith check. Six questions I've got for you, right? Six, okay. Six questions for you, ready? Question number one. Do you believe the resurrection? In other words, do you believe in the resurrection even though you didn't see it with your own eyes? I'm speaking of Jesus' resurrection. And, and there's no, explanation here. These are all yes, no answers. Do you believe the resurrection of Jesus? Question number two. Do you believe that Jesus pays for all your sins? In other words, do you believe that you don't have to pay God back for all of your mistakes? That Jesus paid the price for your lies, your stealing, your abortions, your divorces, your murders, your abuse, your failures, whatever. The, the list is endless. Jesus makes restitution to God for all of your sins. Do you believe that? Yes or no? Question number three. Do you believe that your worst sin has been forgiven? Because everybody's got some sins you know, and ongoing sins, but sometimes there's just one sin that, ugh, it's like an open wound. Do you believe that you are really forgiven for your worst sin, that God has taken even the ugliest thing away? Remember, God, said, God doesn't say your sins, uh, uh, it's okay, I don't mind. No, the Bible says, he puts, his, he puts our sins as far away from Him as east is from west, meaning they're out of sight. Yes, they happened. Yes, but God tells us, but I've forgotten them. They're out of my sight. The problem is they're still in our sight, right? We still remember them. God promises He doesn't remember them. He will not remember them. I remember them no more, He says. But we continue to remember them. Despite this memory, do you believe that you're really forgiven for your worst sin? Yes or no? Number four, do you believe you're going to heaven? In other words, do you believe you're innocent, righteous, acceptable, ready to go to heaven right this moment? This very moment, right? What time is it? It's going on 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. If this place had a gas leak and it blew up and we all died instantly, none of this, well, give me a chance, I need to renegotiate some idea. No. If you were to stroke out this very moment, are you going to heaven? Question number five. Do you believe that despite the evidence to the contrary, God will resurrect you? Do you believe that despite the wrinkles and the arthritis, the soreness, the disease, and the sure death that you face, because all your aches and pains are simply a sign that says you're on your way out. 
Young people don't believe they're ever going to die because they're feeling good all the time. <laughs> they get up, they feel good. They go to bed, they feel good. They sleep 11 hours in a row without waking up, without even turning over. And then they wake up and they feel good. And then somewhere around mm, 30, maybe 35. Whoops. That knee you know, starts to be sore. Oop, got to have a little artho on the knee. And then around 45, you, know, you pick something up and you throw your back out. And then all of a sudden you get out of breath. And it, you know what I'm saying? All these deteriorating signs are simply God's way of saying, hey, you're on your way out. Do you believe that despite all the evidence to the contrary, you will live again? Yes or no? Number six, have you expressed your belief in Jesus Christ through repentance and baptism? Abraham expressed his faith in God. He continued to believe and he continued to obey God. When God said be circumcised, he was circum, you know. Have you expressed your faith in repentance and baptism? Yes or no? There's no maybe next week, perhaps, I'm not sure. That's a yes or no answer. And when I say repentance and baptism, I'm really talking about biblical repentance, biblical baptism. Not baptism when you were a baby, not that baptism. The baptism of a fully conscious adult who says, I believe in Jesus Christ based on my faith in Him, I'm going to be immersed in the waters of baptism. That baptism. Have you repented and had that baptism? Well then, in our little faith check exercise, if you have checked the yes box for these six questions, I'm happy to say that you have the faith of Abraham and you are his true descendants and children. And you know what? I don't say that as a quote Church of Christ minister or teacher. I'm saying according to the scriptures. This is not our quote Church of Christ doctrine. This is what the scriptures actually teach. And your faith has made you righteous in God's eyes just like Abraham's faith did for him. And God bless you for that. And of course, if you have some no's, if you have some no's there, one no, a couple of no's there, then you know, maybe it's time to think about those things. Maybe talk to somebody about those. Maybe there needs to be a little more study happening and obviously myself or Marty or anyone, the elders, anyone here, be happy to study with you and to, let's just talk about it. You know, let's get those no's into yeses. Because if we're still alive, there's still time always to get the no's to be yeses, to firm up our faith, to strengthen our faith. Because this is the way that we are right before God. Okay, so we're going to stop here and I want to start another section. We'll continue with this uh, grace in the book of Romans uh, next time. Thank you for your attention.